uh, you are doing in Florida uh, is a little bit difficult for me because <laughs> this is the first day that I am, uh, uh, I know more or less about the, your doings here in, in Florida, but this is the way uh, to come together to speak. Um, the importance of personal uh, of uh, personal knowledge or personal friendship uh, between uh, Jews and Christians of the different uh, denominations is vital. Um, and speaking uh, from uh, my own experience with uh, different prisons, especially with the Pope uh, Francis. Um, from a pragmatic point of view, all what I heard is the way. This is the way. Um, maybe that uh, one of you can uh, uh, invent some uh, some new activity or some uh, uh, new uh, way in order to enhance this uh, this target. What really I uh, had in mind when I um, heard and when I paid attention to all the activities that uh, you develop here in, uh, in Florida, in Florida, is a uh, rabbinic reflection. Uh, we are speaking about uh, interfaith dialogue. Dialogue undoubtedly begins with words, words with a sense, words which reflects really the truth which is in your heart. Words, sincere words. And uh, this uh, uh, conduct me to think, when began the problem of dialogue? The problem of dialogue began, as you well remember, uh, from the Bible, in Babel, Babylonia, the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel is a, a, a strange story because begins with the words uh, that of all the people in uh, Babel, in Babylonia, had one language, and they had one decision. So well, what's wrong? Why God it, it didn't like what they did? So there is a Midrash that uh, at certain opportunity, uh, the Pope Francis told me that, you know what, I said that from a rabbi, I learned this interpretation of the Tower of Babel, what I'm going to tell you now. How the rabbis in the Talmud, uh, the Midrash, uh, understands what was really the problem in Babylonia. The problem was this, uh, that when putting beside the, the, the very known and ex uh, understanding explanation of what means the, the tower from a scientific point of view, they try to reach God, to, to put themselves in the place of God by technology, which is interesting, by technology, because the, the, the history begins, or this story begins, uh, telling us that they developed a special uh, technology, how to build up uh, towers and houses and so on. So, but the Midrash says, when uh, some of the people who constructed the tower uh, fell from the tower, nothing occurred, no, no one paid, paid attention. But when one brick was destroyed in the tower, they said, oh, we, we are losing time, we are losing the time in the construction of the tower. So the, the value of a brick of the tower was higher than the value of a human being. And how is the end of the, of the story of uh, Babel? That God mixed the languages. One of the exegetists um, who explained this story said, the only way that could be in a society one language is when you have a, a demagogue, when you have a tyrant who imposes a plan, who imposes a language, and all it, uh, 
all the messages must be in the same language and in the same, in the same direction. What occurred in Nazism, uh, what occurs even in Latin American uh, countries uh, in which the liberty of press is uh, uh, it's short, it is, uh, is, uh, is cut. So um, God gave a lesson. You must have your own language. And in the book of the prophet Zephania, the prophet Zephania, chapter three appears that God in the future will give us, all of us, a pure language. To work in interfaith dialogue is to build up, to try to discover this new pure language. And uh, to put aside all demagogic, demagogic languages, to put aside all uh, all false languages and to try to build up a language through which we can understand the really, truly the other. Because the other is using, not by imposition, but from his heart, a language which we can, the unique language, but not by imposition as it was in Babel. In Babel was a tyrant, tyrant, yes in English, tyrant, a tyrant. His name was Nimrod, a character which appears in the book, in the book of uh, in the book of Genesis, very shaky in Hebrew. So, uh, not an imposed language, but a pure language. And when we will have the possibilities to get a little bit of this pure language, sure that uh, God will help us, will bless us, and will reveal us. Uh, the real pure language through which not only that we are going to understand our neighbor, but that we'll have the possibility to speak to God himself. Thanks. Do uh, any members of the panel uh, have any questions for other members? I know that there were lots of ideas shared here today, uh, lots of activities discussed, different uh, ways of engaging one another. Uh, feel free to, to ask uh, a question of, of another uh, member of the panel. The question basically I have is this. Um, somebody commented about all the Baptists and all that sort of stuff. When we take a look and we say, okay, looking at the, at the Jewish community, we see all the different flavors that you guys have too. So, I mean, you know, we see the Orthodox, the Conservative, the Reform, etc. And so, some people just will not allow us to talk to them, the Orthodox. How do we break into that? depends on which ultra-Orthodox you're speaking with. Um, I, I think you're beginning, first of all, there are two flavors of Orthodox. Uh, there's Hasidic uh, Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox, but you also have modern Orthodox, and those communities are growing here in the United States. And I think that they are very much open to some dialogue. So I think you have to be, um, pretty clear on which Orthodox communities you are trying to, uh, whose doors you're trying to open. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, it's only the larger cities in the country that have the modern Orthodox. So in Venice, um, that area, you may not have any, you may only have the uh, ultra-Orthodox. So, you know, you have to have two in order to have a conversation, it may be something that's just not doable. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
the only thing I'll add, and it's related at least, um, one of the differences between the Jewish world and the Christian world is that for the most part, our different, whatever you want to call them, denominations, we all do, we all do see ourselves as one religion. Um, obviously, we're, we are cousins with sometimes extreme differences among us. But uh, if I go to a conservative or even orthodox synagogue, um, I'd be welcome there as a Jew and to participate fully in the service. So on the one hand, that creates a, a, a blurrier landscape. But we also know that it is the, those to whom we are closest that we often get the most defensive about. Um, so sometimes that can actually create a larger barrier. So just to be aware that when you're, you know, if you're talking to a conservative or reformed Jew, we're all just Jews, but then if you start to bring up those denominational differences, the conversation can often get a little tense. I have one other question, and that is that uh, sometimes it comes up uh, in our relationships, and that is the, the right to life issue. So that, I remember one time I was at a, 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 a fundraiser, uh, and I was walking out and saying you know, goodbyes and all that stuff, and this one woman said to me, excuse me, why don't you support Planned Parenthood? And that became sort of an issue, so that's, that's one of the issues that is between us. Do you want to start with that one? <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's an enormous issue. It, it, it really is. Um, Judaism, for the most part, is, is not a right to life religion. Um, there are, you know, by Jewish law, there are times where abortion is not only allowed but arguably mandated. Um, in fact, I, um, I think it was Rabbi Telushkin, Rabbi Joseph Telushkin, who um, I once heard him say that. Um, abortions are never allowed. They're either forbidden or required, depending on the, the, the circumstance. That's, that's one view of the Judaism. So this is an area of, of enormous difference and um, occasionally gets politically tense as well. I don't know if you knew that. Um, <laughs> so in the, with my interfaith ecumenical hat on, my answer is that this doesn't have to be the topic of every interfaith gathering. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, I don't really think we should ever brush it under the cover, this is an enormous area of difference that will probably always be a source of real tension. Um, I, I I won't reveal my political leanings in general. Um, there, most, the people who know me know that I am I'm, I'm fairly strident in one direction of the political spectrum, and I have some friends on the other end of, of the political spectrum. And um, if we talk politics, it drives me crazy. And if we talk baseball, I love them. <laughs> and so there are times I make sure we just talk about baseball sure. because I want to love them. Good point. I agree on the difference. I agree where we can agree. But don't, don't shun somebody because you disagree with one another. Right. And when we have to disagree, disagree. I mean, I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't think this should be an issue we don't talk about. But it goes back to that relationship. The way I talk to you about this will be. Um, moderated if I love you. It's much easier to demonize someone, and this is why we all know the internet is so terrible for these discussions, because you can cast the worst versions at Facebook because you have never and will never meet this person. But if I have this built a relationship, as much as I may get angry over the issue, I'm going to pull back just the way in which I speak because I care about you. It goes back to, the, there's been one theme I've heard over and over again today, it's that all of this is about relationship. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that the other thing that I would add to this is is that not all of us Jews speak with the same voice. Uh, I think it's important to understand. Let's say, and, and I'll talk about my position. I think that um, abortion should be a uh, uh, there should be an opportunity for abortion under the right circumstances, but at the same time, 
very, very carefully understood and studied in terms of a woman's decision. And so it's not as though all Jews automatically are totally in favor of abortion. Um, as Rabbi was saying, in Jewish law, abortion, other than things like rape and incest, abortion is allowed only in the process of, of the birthing itself, and only if the head and the shoulders of the baby have um, emerged, and the mother's life and the baby's life are really fighting against each other, then the mother's life takes precedence. Other than that, abortion really isn't allowed. And in liberal Judaism, which we both represent, Jewish law has had to kind of take a look at this and point out that there were cases in the Talmud where a woman who was pregnant, who had been found guilty of a capital crime and was to be executed, the decision was made to go ahead and um, abort the baby first so the mother wouldn't go through the embarrassment of, of having uh, the baby aborted while in the process of being capitally punished. And therefore, the mother's feelings and sense of embarrassment come into play. So it's a very complicated area, and I think that all of us need to understand that in all of our faiths, there are a great deal of complexity and complication in the views that we hold. Um, and that's why I think the dialogue is so important. I always talk about the fact that there was a polling company in 1972 that went around the country to find out if we should go get out of Vietnam. And that that same polling company, when they found that 72% of the Indians on a Native American reservation in South Dakota thought we should get out of Vietnam, 100% of those Native Americans thought we should get out of the United States. <laughs> now, if you think about that for a second, you see things through your own eyes, through your own experiences. And that being the case, that's why that dialogue is important, including gaining the nuances even within position, uh, positions that are taken within theological. Uh, as, as we close, uh, in order to recognize the fact that uh, not everyone at a panel table today uh, you know, uh, or, the, or the Catholic Jewish relations in Florida is not limited to those who sat panel tables, uh, we wanted to introduce a very special guest today that has uh, uh, conducted dialogues for a very long time and I uh, wanted to pass the mic to Deacon uh, Pat to do that. Yeah, I'd like to recognize Ida Margolis from uh, Naples. Uh, she is uh, very instrumental and very involved in so many of the activities down there, and so much of the load of carrying the uh, dialogue rests on her shoulders. And she's traveled to uh, Washington and been at the AJC uh, Global Forum, and doesn't miss uh, miss an event at the diocese. By the way, everybody is cordially invited on April the 30th of 2017 to the Cathedral in Venice to uh, witness the Yom HaShoah memorial service that we're gonna have there. Uh, we're having a, a gifted rabbi, Rabbi Howard Simon, who's gonna be our honored guest speaker at that time, and so it should be good. Put on your calendars, April 30th. I don't see anybody writing. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming out today. Uh, we hope to see you at the reception. Uh, have, a, have a wonderful afternoon.